Okay, so thank you everyone for joining today. This presentation is called Supercharging Your Scholarly Presence in Three Easy Steps. Uh, a couple of things to note right off the bat, I have this slide deck here at bit.ly, so bit.ly forward slash scholarly pres 22. I suggest you open that up and save it. Uh, this is a resource, this presentation, it's full of links. There's gonna be a lot of stuff in here that we're just basically gonna barely touch upon and you might wanna come back to later and actually explore the links or install the software. And so that's the goal of this presentation slide deck. So it's gonna live on, it'll be there throughout um, at least the semester and usually longer. And that's the permanent URL it's at. So scholarlypres.22, excuse me, scholarlypres22. And I always have this on the slide deck. So um, if you need to see it, uh, you can get there. All right, so let's jump right in. We're also gonna be using a software called Mentimeter, which allows us to do some interactive uh, questions and answers. And there'll be really clear instructions about how to use that when we get there. Uh, but just FYI, you might wanna have your phone handy or your computer handy if you wanna follow along and do those in real time. So a little bit about me, I'm Marco Saifoli Valencia. I'm the Open Education Librarian. I also manage the Gary Strong Curriculum Center. Uh, my email is marcosv at uidaho.edu. So if you have any questions about anything that we cover here today, just reach out to me and I'd be happy to follow up and do a session with you. Just gonna double check the chat, make sure we're okay. Perfect, okay. Uh, Hanwin did put a little survey in the chat. So just uh, to remind folks that it's very important for us to get a little bit of feedback about how these presentations go. So I'll draw your attention there again at the end as well, just in case you notice that, uh, drawing your attention there now. Okay, so three easy steps to follow to get started with a positive professional web presence. I understand a lot of you probably already have the start of a professional web presence, but we're just gonna frame it as getting started and then you can adapt it for what you need. And as part of that, we're gonna learn more about some different scholarly platforms and some different scholarly social media strategies and techniques. So we're gonna talk about ORCID, Google Scholar Author Profiles, Altmetrics, scholarly social media, some other stuff I've got peppered in there. And make sure to stay tuned to the end for a life-changing digital, digital clutter hack. So that's my little clickbait to get you to stick around to the end of this, especially if you're watching the recording, or you can always just scroll ahead and see what that little productivity tool is. All right, so what is scholarly presence? Um, before the internet, this really meant things like papers and proceedings, uh, talks and conversations at conferences, service appointments, non-peer reviewed, but still scholarly writing, sort of the some things where people would understand and recognize you as a scholar. And I pulled in a little bit of imagery here. So I'm um, thinking back to the first uh, peer reviewed publication, according to Wikipedia, this happened in 1665 by Henry Oldenburg, who's the founding editor of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society at the Royal Society of London. So this is Burlington House where the society was based between 1873 and 1967. This is John Evelyn who helped to found the Royal Society. I, I throw these in there because this is like exactly sort of what I picture when I think of scholarly presence. Um, it, it feels sometimes sort of like an outdated term, but it's important to understand that scholarly presence these days means a lot of really contemporary stuff that you're probably interacting with all the time. So after the internet, it includes all of those other things. We do still have papers and proceedings. We do still have uh, conferences. We do still have service appointments in different professional and other scholarly organizations. Uh, we do still have non-peer reviewed, but still scholarly writing. And at the same time, we've got websites and blogs. We've got social media. We have all kinds of analytics. We have research and scholarly profile platforms, and we have other emerging and evolving platforms that are sort of coming out of the woodwork as we speak. So some scholars who are peer reviewed and published and their social media, I just kind of threw these up here as quick links. Um, this is a very long slide deck, so I'm not gonna go into every link on every page, but this is just a few folks that I sort of knew off right at the top of my head. I'm like, these are folks that I uh, have referenced or admire, or I'm familiar with their research, right? And I'm familiar with them as scholars, but they also have these other sort of outposts. So uh, Native Appropriations is a really great website or blog that talks about an indigenous perspective on a lot of contemporary native topics. Uh, social media, this is Twitter. I follow a lot of native gaming developers on there, which includes people who are both academics and also game developers. Um, and Marissa Duarte is one of my um, information science scholar icons. And so this is her Google Scholar profile, which we'll actually look at that one more in depth later because hers is a, a really great example of a, a fully filled out one of those. 
So the first thing um, we're going to do for this interactive question setup is you do need to go along um, to either this first URL, bit.ly school hyphen prez hyphen vote, or you can just go to minty.com and it will ask you for this code. Either way, when you get there, put in that code. So it's 75934655. And Hanwin, if you could throw that in the chat, I think that would be so helpful for folks just so they can catch it. Uh, again, the code is 75934655. And you just go to minty, M-E-N-T-I dot com and punch in that code. And when you do that, we will have some interactive questions. So I'm going to leave this up for just a beat longer. So any stragglers can write it down 75, 93, 46, 5. Okay. So once we do that, we're going to actually have some interactive questions that we can go through together. And I need to adjust my Mintimeter for you here. And I can actually fire this up on my side and get that going. So. So this first question, check all that apply. What social media apps or sites do you use most days? So the goal of this question is just check which of these you use on a typical day. We've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Reddit, some disciplinary specific space I'm not thinking of, and then other, right? And I know there's a whole lot of other options uh, that could go into that one. So we'll give folks just a few minutes to fill in some ideas here. A lot of folks still on Facebook. I think that's really interesting because I feel like we've been hearing about the great uh, decline of Facebook for a long time. And when I do these polls, there's a lot of people who are still using it. I personally use Facebook a lot. There's a lot of really specific groups on there, including some research and scholarly focused ones that I make connections with librarians, archivists, fellow researchers in my areas of interest that I wouldn't reach otherwise. And I literally see conference proposal ideas, research proposal ideas, like there's a wealth of information out there. Twitter, um, Instagram, you know, I think this is, I didn't ask about personal or professional use here. So if I had to guess, I would say probably some of these like the TikTok and Snapchat, they're more likely uh, personal use, but we don't know for sure. And we do have a couple of people who are already on LinkedIn. So for those folks, you'll be a little bit ahead of the curve when we start talking about LinkedIn. And one vote for Reddit. Um, I feel like Reddit gets kind of a bad rep and, um, it you know, can be sort of a not very scholarly place. And it can also be a place that's um, full of some pretty interesting long form discussions um, if you know the sort of right search tools to get to where you need to go. Okay, all right. So thank you to everyone who participated with this. I'm gonna go ahead and advance this to our next question just in the interest of time here. So let me do that. Okay, so where do you already have a professional profile? So I'm just kind of interested for folks who are here uh, in this session right now, where do you already have some kind of professional shingle out? So a, a LinkedIn page, a Facebook that you use professionally, a Twitter, something disciplinary specific, Vivo, which is sort of um, like the UI's version of LinkedIn, but it's more focused on research. We'll talk about it more later, personal website or blog, and then others. Okay, great. So folks have already gotten started and a lot of folks have utilized LinkedIn, which is always, um, a smart and obvious choice. It's there. There's a lot of people on it. It's kind of like Facebook in our previous example where these social networks work best when there's a lot of people there in aggregate, right? So these Facebook groups partly work because there's so many people on Facebook. And similarly, LinkedIn's a great place to have a profile started kind of no matter the level of your career, even um, people who are just starting out can benefit from having a presence there. Okay, great. So this is going to be very helpful, I think, for us to talk about um, a little bit more and thank you for sharing your input there. We will have one question a little bit later on. For now, let's talk about step one. So I'm gonna jump back into the slide deck and if you're watching along that way, um, feel free. Let me, let me see if I can make this big screen. A too big. Okay, okay. So intentional scholarly presence. Why is that something that you would wanna do? So our scholarly presence will be crafted for us by our personal social media if we don't fill the void. So what does that mean? It means if you don't step in and put something to come up when someone searches your name, then all this other stuff that you might not intend or want everyone to see will come in and fill that void for you. Uh, creating an intentional scholarly presence creates opportunities for collaboration and connection with colleagues 
and across disciplines, right? So it allows you to network with the people you already know, and it also allows you to do interdisciplinary networking connection. It's useful for scoping and defining your own goals or areas of focus, precisely because of what I just said, right? It allows you to get exposed to so many more different types of research topics once you're in a network. So an intentional scholarly presence really helps. It allows you to be identifiable to other people and it allows you to identify people who are gonna have aligned research interests or who might help you generate or further your own scholarly development. One way that you might get started with an intentional scholarly presence that is very scholarly is an ORCID. Um, I always did go back and forth on what to call these. I sometimes call them ORC IDs, like Tolkien-esque, like ORC. Um, and sometimes I try to think of it like the flower. I think the proper pronunciation is ORCID. So ORCID is a nonprofit organization that assigns these IDs that you can sort of think of as like a permanent uh, URL and number that is always going along with you and your research. Uh, this is especially important uh, depending on, you know, the sort of uniqueness of your name. My name, Marco Saifli Valencia, is a pretty unique name. Uh, there's only three people that I know of that have that Saifli Valencia last name. However, Marco Valencia is an extremely common name, and there are literally like seemingly millions of people who have that name. And so in some of these systems where I have things automated, I get a lot of attributes for articles that I haven't written. What ORCID allows you to do is say, I'm this Marco Valencia. If that was my name, if it was a name that was easily confusable with someone else, I can say, this is me. It also allows you to share your data and it's being increasingly centralized in a lot of different repository systems. The University of Idaho is a member of ORCID, which means that you can sign up and get a membership and get involved entirely for free without any cost or expense to you. It creates a durable URL with that unique number where you can create a digital CV and profile, and it can automatically update publications from trusted organizations. You can then get to create and maintain your profile so you can have it set up to sort of be automatically adding stuff, but then you can go and edit things as you need. I mentioned Marissa Duarte earlier, so let's take a look at her ORCID. She has a really nice page where we can really see a sort of great overall history of what she's done and where she's been. So she's filled out her employment activity. She's filled out her education and other qualifications. She's put her professional service organization. She's put these grants, which is super helpful, both for understanding what do grants look like at a certain level? What do the people that I admire, what are they producing? But also thinking as you develop like, oh, maybe this is a potential collaborator. You know, maybe this is someone I should reach out to as a consultant or some expertise on my grant. Uh, she also has her published works in here, as well as I believe some of her scholarly proceedings, although I could be wrong. Looks like no. So this is not a CV, right? It's different in the sense that there's like sort of um, a standardization for items that get on here. And at the same time, it is pretty comprehensive. So this is a great way to see what ORCID can do for you. Um, you can also have, I think, a more minimal one. I don't have not done, I don't think, anything to update mine since I created it. So we can see what it sort of did by itself, right? So I personally, in my discipline, we don't use ORCID as much as some of the other like STEM disciplines do in information science. And so I've been slower to update this versus some of my other web presences. You can see, though, that just by establishing an ORCID account, it pulled in some information about me. I gave it this information when I started, but then it went and found this journal article that I wrote in 2021. So it will eventually start to filter in and pull things, but ideally I would get in here and fill this out and make it more comprehensive in a way that maybe my Vivo presence is, which I'll touch on that later and show that to you. Okay, so let me jump back into this deck over here. If you wanna learn more, uh, there's an easy registration link, this how to use ORCID video, all these great links, check them out. That's part of what the slide deck is for. So you can go back and pursue the things that you're interested in and get support to. Okay, so some final thoughts. This might be required in some disciplines for grants and publications. It's a durable, permanent URL and ID, and that automated update is available. It's a handy, and it can be an easy way to confuse people if you're getting other people's attributions. So just make sure that you kind of strike the balance depending on the likelihood of other articles that don't belong to you being attributed to you. All right, uh, something that some can be commonly confused with ORCIDs are uh, digital object identifiers. You can think of this as sort of like a barcode for an article, a journal, any sort of digital proceeding. Certain websites have been able to get DOIs, although it's not every website that gets one. So you can think of it as being sort of a complementary concept to ORCID, but not exactly the same thing, right? So your ORCID page 
might contain a number of peer reviewed articles that each have their own unique DOI, which is a similar concept in that that URL and number associated with that durable object should be there for a long time across many migrations and location changes of the underlying data. Google Scholar author profiles offer something similar to the ORCID style profiles, but they do it through Google Scholar. So let's take a look at Marissa Duarte again. Here you can get a similar overview of her, but with more detail in some areas and less in others. So these Google Scholar profiles really focus a lot on publications, and they're a great way to get a pretty comprehensive overview of not only when and how someone has published, but to also see easily their number of citations, as well as to access some rapid sort of stats about their impact factors. So Marissa Elena Duarte is a very influential academic in information science and is specifically in the spheres about indigenous information science. And so she has quite a high number of citations, especially for a relatively uh, still fairly new scholar in the academy. So in this space, she has uh, set this up as well as having, I'm sure, some automated things where these articles are added to her profile. So if you were to create your own version of this, you could just go into Google Scholar, fairly straightforward instructions about how to set this up. And then you just need to kind of track and monitor to see, okay, what's populating through and does that belong to me? Um, you will see that the Google Scholar pages don't necessarily list things like grants or job positions. And so they're not the best for capturing all kinds of experience, but they are really great for capturing uh, this publication history and for seeing citation patterns. If you're not used to using Google Scholar in this way, a thing I like to do is to take um, a particular entry like this one and to look at this like cited by. This will actually show you everything that's formally cited this article, so everything that's come after. And then I also like the related articles. Something to know about the related is that's using sort of Google's black box of information about you. So these tend to get better as you kind of use the same account. I always log in with my little library Marco up there. I'm in here. It gets better because it knows what I click on and like. And also at the same time, it's a little creepy because it's a black box. I don't know how much of my personal browsing data is filtering what's coming in here. So keep that in mind. And keep in mind that related doesn't mean anything in that sort of formal academy way, right? Thinking back to that old prestigious Royal House of London, related articles isn't a thing. Cited by is this longstanding disciplinary convention of citing people who come uh, before us and do relevant scholarship and research. So it's the Google Scholar profiles. Um, we do have a little bit of information about how to set those up, uh, but it's pretty, pretty easy and straightforward. And you can have these things talk to each other. So you can import to ORCID from a Google Scholar profile. So you might go through and get all your publications lined up the way you like in Google Scholar, and then just go and click one button and import that into ORCID. Um, as I said, automated search results can be automatically added to your profile, which is both a blessing and a curse, depending on how common your name is and the likelihood of uh, other publications being assigned to you that don't belong to you. Okay. Um, I already mentioned this. If you're curious for more um, information about how the Google Scholar profile pages works, all that information on there, this blog post, it's getting a little old, 2018, but I double checked it uh, prepping for this lecture. It's still good. It's got good relevant information and it can help you to understand some of the information on that page because there's quite a bit. So check back on that one if you're curious to learn more about the Google Scholar profile page. Some of you might be wondering about traditional measures of scholarly impact, like impact factor. Um, for articles, we tend to think of it as the number of citations or the quality of the journal that you're publishing in. Uh, for instance, publishing in Nature is considered extremely prestigious. It's challenging to get an article published in that journal. And typically they have a high number of citations as they go out into the world and are cited in reference. Uh, similarly then in that case, journals, uh, Nature is an extremely uh, high impact factor ranking journal. Uh, journal impact factor is generally the best known example. I have mentioned these as being like credit scores, um, which if you're familiar with your credit score, there's like actually three different agencies that give you a credit score and they are different. And so that is also true with journal metrics and rankings. So we have something called the journal impact factor. We have something called a site score, SJR and SNP, which all comes from a company called Scopus. And then we have those Google Scholar metrics, which use sort of a combination of both these and then some other um, sort of like raw number of citation data that Google pulls in. 
So each of these is kind of their own thing, and this could be a whole separate presentation. So we're really only going to briefly touch upon these traditional rankings to compare them to alt metrics. But if you're curious to learn more about traditional metrics, I've got it covered. I've got a YouTube video that's pretty handy, some libguides, and a workshop that happened here back in 2018, I believe, that really goes deep into those metrics. And so traditional metrics are something that I also recommend talking to your advisor, um, someone in your department about, because it really does vary by discipline, which are the ones that you need to track. And so this is something where uh, more like a gateway into this, and then you can judge by your own discipline how much you need to emphasize a particular type of traditional metric over another. If you're curious to find more about metrics on a particular journal, these are ways that you can look that up. So if you're thinking about publishing in a particular journal and you want to know, there are these indexes out there that will show you how something ranks. Okay, I'm tempted to click on these links, but we really don't have time, so we're just going to keep moving on. Uh, but trust that they're there and they're worth checking out if you need to know about traditional metrics. Alt metrics are like traditional metrics, but they're around the sort of emerging social sphere of this online scholarly presence. So alt metrics might include social media shares, downloads, linking or bookmarking in certain citation managers. It's not the same as scholarly metrics, right? So if you say, I wrote this blog post and it got 15,000 shares, you're not going to get tenure, right? That's not going to replace a peer-reviewed article if you need that to be fulfilling that role. However, having that alongside a peer-reviewed article where you can say, not only is this uh, showing impact in these traditional impact factors, it's published in a scholarly prestigious journal, but also this article has been shared 15,000 times on social media. Um, it's been indexed uh, in a particular citation manager a certain number of times. Those type of stories help to, or figures help to tell the story and the impact of your research. So it's not the same, but it's a useful addition. One of the things that can be challenging about altmetrics is there's like millions of them. And so this uh, listing metrics toolkit helps you to kind of brainstorm different things that might be relevant to you by discipline, right? So thinking about Twitter mentions, uh, Wikipedia citations, GitHub, that's a collaborative software program, right? So this is an online repository where we can co-develop code together. You might include certain number of specific functions that you do on that to show, look, this is how many people are uh, using and repurposing our code. This is my contribution to an open uh, source code environment, right? So different uh, alt metrics are going to apply in different contexts. Some of them are going to seem really clear, like, number of downloads, but others are going to be very specific, like monograph holdings, right? The number of libraries that own a book. This metric is falling out of favor somewhat, but let's say that you're trying to see, um, I don't know, you're a children's author or something, you publish a, a children's literature book and you want to say, this is part of the impact of this. Now there's this many places that hold it. This is the kind of metric that you can purpose for that. So that's what this uh, tab is for. If you want to check it out, they've got quite a bit of information on this metrics toolkit page. It's just intended to give you a broad overview into uh, alt metrics and which ones you might want to select to start tracking for your own disciplinary research. I'm going to drag my control bar there. That's better. All right, let's just keep on going on here. Um, Hanren, let me know in chat if we got any questions or anything. Otherwise, I'll just assume we're doing okay. So altmetrics can be added as a plugin to your browser. Uh, what's cool about that is then when you're browsing specific journals or seeing an article kind of in context like that, there's a little button up here you can just click and it'll show you the altmetrics, how many times it's been downloaded, um, how many times has it been shared, those kinds of things. And so that can be a handy little thing to add to your setting. We're not going to go through and use this because this Altmetric tool, this is the best one that I found. It does require you to sign up for a free, very basic membership. Um, it doesn't ask you to pay for anything. I've used it for years, uh, but it is kind of a little process that you need to follow. And then it'll give you this kind of example data. Actually, let me just see if I can kind of be a little, be a little improv -y here and just zoom in on that. So you can see this, it'll show you on any given article, the number of times it's tweeted, Facebook shares, Reddits, blogs, um, other times it's been saved in Citation Manager, et cetera. So this is something you're interested in. It can be just a fun little addition to your browser that you use in doing your research. 
And then you can just click that button and see what's the alt metrics on this content I'm looking at. Okay. So your social media presence also extends beyond alt metrics into both intended and unintended channels. For professional social media channels can help you control and define your own narrative. So think carefully about the content you want to associate with your real name and info, right? So this comes back to, again, this concept of the most important thing is that the presence is intentional because otherwise people are going to find what's out there and associate with you, and you may or may not want them to be doing that. So to follow that up, step two of the three easy steps is to lock it down. And what this really means is to really determine where you want privacy. Everyone's going to have a different take on this. Some people have lived their lives very online in a very private way, and that's fine for them. They're going to keep their stuff kind of uh, bookmark, or excuse me, like a uh, like locked off, right? Private tweets. They don't. They're they're active on Twitter, but they don't need to let everyone see it. Other folks have had very public uh, social media lives where they're happy to sort of let people see their chronology on Instagram or something. I'm always surprised at the number of folks who are using their regular full name as an Instagram handle and not necessarily realizing how a perfectly well-intentioned employer who wants to find out more about you or uh, admissions program, a scholarly collaborator, how they can easily inadvertently come across that content. And the fact of the matter is, is people aren't supposed to look at that kind of content, but they often do. So it's just really important to think about what content you want to have associated with your professional presence and to kind of steer and shape people where you're going. Uh, where, where you want that to go. So taking steps to lock down your accounts, considerations vary by platform. This is a handy little uh, link that kind of gives you different things to think about by platform. So thinking back to some of those examples earlier, um, I didn't ask about this one, but let's say you're really active on YouTube. You know, let's say you love to comment on YouTube and you've got some particular interests and, you know, maybe you don't want everyone to know exactly everything you're into in your personal life. And so thinking about, is my YouTube channel that I'm commenting on, how easily associatable with that with me is that is important to think about. And like I said, it's going to vary by what platform you use and how you engage with it. Sometimes people don't know that you can do things like batch delete old content. So for instance, if you've got a bunch of old tweets, you can use uh, tweet delete, and it will allow you to say, delete everything from this particular time period, delete all these old ones, delete everything, whatever you want to do. So that can be a handy way to just sort of go behind you and kind of clear up your digital presence and make sure that it's creating the impression that you're going for and that you're only sharing the information that you're wanting to share in the way that you want to. So just kind of summarize this, really, it's not that you have to do any one way. It's not that you can only be successful with totally public presence. And it's not that you have to lock everything down and be sort of terrified of negative outcomes. It's more about creating privacy where you want and need it. Uh, I suggest you Google yourself and to do it from browsers that aren't you don't use normally or from private browsing mode. Um, and it, it can be really interesting to see what comes up when it's not you know, coming out of your personalized search results. And so that can just be a handy thing to do from time to time. Sometimes you'll find really positive stuff. Like I will do it and find interesting um, art write-ups or articles that I didn't know had happened, little blog posts, things like that. Uh, doxing is a real concern. For those who don't know, doxing is where your personal information gets posted online in a way designed to generate harassment of you. Um, so a good idea is just to not put out personal identifiable information unintentionally, right? So we've kind of moved away from this idea of the internet as a place where you should never put in your credit card or your address. We all do that a lot now. Um, but, you know, 15 years ago, that was considered kind of risky in some ways. So at this point, we're definitely in a stage in our culture where you do need to have some personal identifiable information out there, but it needs to be intentional, right? So make sure that when people search your name and find your presence, it's the one that you want them to find and not, you know, your old MySpace page from 2000. Uh, step three. So once you've done this, once you've created your space that you want to have and limited the other ones that you want to have private, then you're free to engage and have fun and interact and build some social networks. So some advantages that this can give you are you can engage and build those networks in your discipline. You can get that interdisciplinary exposure. It's a great accessible and powerful form of networking. It can help you both when you're going to conferences, just add those folks to your LinkedIn, add them to your Twitter. I actually got a little stamp that I would use on my business cards for in-person conferences and I, it's my Twitter handle and I would stamp certain 
business cards, you know, because it's like, well, not everybody needs to be my Twitter friend, but maybe certain people I'm feeling like, yes, this person's going to be Twitter friend. This person's going to be on LinkedIn. So think about how to consciously build those networks in these social spaces. Um, it can also be great for funding and job opportunities, right? There's a lot of things that you can find on social media that you just wouldn't find. And also those algorithms start referring more and more relevant content to you based on what you show an interest in. Some examples from my life. Uh, this was a cool indigenous game developer opportunity. Uh, this was an actual like a uh, sort of, I guess like a fellowship or like consortium of people starting up indigenous game devs. And so they started out uh, with a Discord space and a Facebook space. And so again, I found this on Twitter. Um, it gave me access to a group that I didn't know about and it gave me sort of secondary platforms to go follow up with and then I could participate as I wanted to. And there's stuff like this for like literally Probably we could go around this room and everyone could say their discipline and we could go on Twitter and find something similar like this for that. Uh, similarly, sometimes scholarly things are happening on Twitter. So I always like to pull this one up. This was a person I follow who was criticizing an article that had this um, probably not very factual citation. It says women experience basic emotions more intensely, except perhaps anger. And, you know, most people recognize this as a kind of outdated stereotype that has not been scholarly demonstrated or proven, but this person was citing it like it was a fact. So this particular person uh, looked up these citations and they got, they got in there. They were like, wow, these four citations, three actually don't even address this topic. And one uh, says it verbatim, so that's the source of this. But when we track down those citations, they actually claim the opposite, right? So this person is actually showing a pretty uh, intense and in-depth citational checking process, which is, honestly admirable and what we should be doing with more of our citations. Um, and then they're using Twitter to share about it, right? And so this not only gave me an example that I can use in teaching and research, but it also sort of, you know, shows me a different way of doing this that isn't just about sort of generating citations in the academy, right? Like it's interesting to see different people's process working through stuff like this. Um, I always like to throw this example up too. This is a map of uh, Bigfoot sightings. I hop locations and then Mulder from the X-Files saying, Scully, you're not gonna believe this. Uh, with the inference being that Bigfoots are coming from IHOP or maybe are going to IHOP. I like to use this, um, I use these images as an example of a false causation uh, example in a lecture. And so again, this is just something where Twitter gave me something humorous that then I could use in the classroom. So just thinking about all the different ways that these kinds of social media presences can kind of passively inform your scholarship and teaching without you having to go out and sort of you know find stuff. I do also just want to mention that sometimes people aren't aware of how much data is in your digital objects. And so one of the most obvious examples is like your pictures will always have GPS or location data unless you specifically shut it off or it was taken with like an old school camera that doesn't have that. But if it's something that's coming off your phone, it most likely has that type of data. So just think about that, you know, you're gonna hear metadata more and more as um, I think it sort of permeates society, this concept, but really what it means is just that there's always extra info associated with things that can tell you where it came from, right? So even if I tried to block out this data here, someone sophisticated could probably download these images from these original tweets if I were to share them and say, oh, this actually came from user so-and-so, right? And then they could actually see who I'm following, so on and so forth. So just keep in mind that anything that's digital has a lot more sort of back-end hidden information than you might readily see, and we call that metadata. Okay, so I promise we talked about LinkedIn. Um, a lot of you already have a good start on it. I wanted to show you this because I thought it was funny. This is uh, Jennifer Lopez's LinkedIn. I actually saw an article referencing this um, where someone was talking about it just in a humorous perspective. And it shows basically just kind of these very basic elements that you need for LinkedIn profile, right? This is obviously someone I believe catfishing Jennifer Lopez. I do not believe she set this up or chose this as her background. Uh, but it gives you a sense of what you need to just have a bare sense of a, a LinkedIn, a bare shingle out there getting you started. And you can see the fun ways that you get to describe yourself, right? She's a mom, a partner, an actor, singer, film and television producer, and so many other things because she's JLo. Um, a lot of ours are going to be a lot more modest than this but also probably more filled out with our connections and our actual uh, affiliations because we're real people and not a bot pretending to be Jennifer Lopez. But if you need more information about setting up your LinkedIn, I've got a couple links um, here. So getting started with LinkedIn, this is a great resource. Uh, this also goes to the LinkedIn video page on their YouTube, 
which could be handy just for folks who already have a LinkedIn, but maybe are curious, like, how do I make this a little bit better? Um, how do I get more people to give me recommendations? Uh, how do I offer recommendations? However, you're looking to sort of expand your presence, you can use that and check it out. Uh, sometimes you do need these other formats for capturing work history or activity that is just not represented well in your publications, or excuse me, not represented as publications. Um, it's just also great to have that network space where you can connect and find those disciplinary connections. Um, you can build your own site, but you don't have those social networking connections as easily, or you can use a platform like LinkedIn, which then can direct people to a personal profile site if you've got one of those. I mentioned Vivo, which is a solution that we have here at the University of Idaho. And this is something where um, you can check and see what different faculty are doing. Um, Hanwin, do you know, is Vivo available to graduate students? Hanwin's not sure. I'm not sure on that one either. I think it is not by default, but we should double check with that. And that would be a great thing to go to the data hub and ask about if you're curious. Um, how to get started with this as a graduate student. But this could help you to identify faculty and the potential collaborators. It's also just an interesting way to see different ways that profiles are laid out, right? So here again, me, uh, my positions that I hold, uh, Vivo is sort of like Google Scholar in that it automatically pulls in uh, my publications and as well as some of my other collaborative activity, like this grant that I got, a little bit of background information, and my full contact name. Uh, one of the things that I was exploring with this and prepping for this was some of these co-author networks, which are pretty cool. This can be an interesting way to see who folks at the U of I are publishing with to learn more about our sort of publishing connections. And there's a similar feature offered for co-investigators, which means co-PIs, so people who I'm on grants with. I'm going to go off script real quick and see if I can find, do you, Idaho, do graduate students have access? Has anyone in here heard about Vivo before? Has it been told to you? Yeah, well, we'll check with this and come back to it later. So I don't have that answer. I should have anticipated that one and thought it through a little bit more. But that is Vivo, great way to learn about activity at the U of I and to find faculty as potential partners. And we, I don't think it's available for graduate students, but we will send out an update if that's incorrect. You do want to be cautious with academia.edu and ResearchGate. Um, these are not open repositories. So uh, I know as you're just sort of getting familiar with things, a lot of things kind of sound similar. It's like it's a repository, it stores code, it stores publication. It's like sort of open, but not really. So I made this little chart uh, to kind of help you to see the difference between these things. So open access repositories support export or harvesting. They're there for long-term preservation. They're usually nonprofit and they don't send you a lot of emails or spam. They don't want your contact list and they fulfill these funding requirements and other sorts of technical things that you have to require, that are required for different grant and other funded activity. Academia.edu basically do the opposite of those things. So they, while they do sort of make things more available, they don't really support export or harvesting, meaning they don't allow libraries to come through and index that stuff and make it more available. You have to go to academia.edu and use their website to access them. They don't have a long-term preservation goal, so you can put something in there and go, great, I've shared it, and then academia could sell itself to ResearchGate tomorrow and they could do something completely different with your content. Um, and we are seeing this happen in some different open platforms, actually. So um, it's where open platforms were open, but also owned by publishers and the publishers did what publishers do and sell them. So thinking about the sort of differences between these systems, you know, academia.edu and ResearchGate, you know, oftentimes you may access those to just grab an article. I'm not going to really take a position on that one way or the other. Ideally, we would love for you to use interlibrary loan, but I understand research deadlines are what they are. So sometimes it's just about accessing what you need. But they're just not a great place to share your stuff. And they're certainly not the only place that you want to be sharing your stuff. If you want to find more open repositories, again, this could be a whole separate lecture. So I've just got a couple of lists here that can help you identify a specific disciplinary repository that could work for you. Um, this is just an example of pulling out the math focus. There's also this directory of open access journals if you're curious to look up. Uh, what a trusted and uh, verified open access journal in your discipline area might be to think about publishing. 
Why might you want to do this? Publishing in open increases citations and reads of your research. And um, so if you want to learn more about this, this article talks a little bit about how journals from top open access publishers get more citations on average. So this first bar chart shows you, um, you know, there was about a quarter of a million open access publishers versus 2.1 million traditional publisher articles, right? So these are articles published in 2020. You got about 2 million traditional ones and about a quarter million uh, open access ones. And the average citations, even with that, is much higher for those open access articles. And it makes sense. It's because people can get your stuff, right? So the easier it is to get your stuff inside it, the more people are going to do just that. Similarly, sharing your research data helps with that too. This is a more recent article that talks about how sharing your research papers helps your research to get cited more, excuse me, sharing your research data helps your papers to get cited more as well, right? So particularly by discipline, sharing your data is just as important as sharing the paper in some kind of open access situation. So read through those if you're curious to learn more. Um, we're moving quick here and trying to get to the end of our time. So just make sure to search yourself so you know what's out there. Try to tie up those loose end digital web presences that you don't want anymore. Um, that can include undergraduate projects, which can sometimes linger on a long time and sometimes require many emails or things to old uh, colleagues to get something taken down or adjusted. And you don't have to be on all these platforms at once to be successful. Pick one or two to start on and then grow your presence from there, right? So for instance, my Vivo profile is a lot more complete than my Google Scholar profile, which makes sense because at this stage in my career, I'm doing a lot more inter-university collaboration than external collaboration. As I start to seek out more collaborations outside of the university, it'll become even more important for me to get that ORCID ID and that Google Scholar profile figured out because most people outside of the U of I are not gonna come to Vivo to check me out there. Okay, so I promised a productivity hack. Uh, this is a little plug for a free tool called OneTab and I'm gonna show you it in action right now. So as you can see, Hopefully I've got a bunch of tabs open because I've been showing you all this stuff and I haven't been clicking it down and closing it. This might look familiar to you from some of your research sessions. If you're anything like me, you click on a lot of links and then you get like 50 open and then it's time to log off and what are you gonna do? If you use one tab, which you can use in Chrome or Firefox, it allows you to collapse all those links and easily save them. So I'm gonna pull out this presentation so that we don't lose it. Okay, we're gonna minimize that guy down there. All right, so now I've got all the stuff that we've been looking at together and I have one tab installed. So one thing to know about one tab is like if you're using Chrome with multiple profiles, it's profile specific, right? So if I install it on my Marco the Vandal at Gmail, it's not there on my personal one unless I install it there too. So don't let that throw you off if you notice it there sometimes, but not all the time. So here, here we are in my Firefox. I'm just gonna click this button and it's gonna do some magic. Where did it all go? Where's my stuff, right? When I open Firefox back up, there it is. It's clicked and saved all of that for me as a list. I can share it as a web page. So if I wanted to say, hey, did you see that cool JLo LinkedIn profile? I could take this, control paste it, put it in the chat. Everyone can see those links. There's also this little QR code if you're into those. I personally am still trying to find the perfect use case for QR code, but if you need it, it's there. You can also restore all of those tabs when you're ready to get back in. So you just click and save, restore all, they're all back. Okay, you know, I close down a couple more and then I say, oh, you know what? I gotta go, I'm done with this again. One tab it again, keep saving it. And it stores all of these in your history. So this is my long U Idaho one tab history. And I can go back and easily reference those when I need them. So that's a little productivity hack. It's called one tab, it's free and easy to use. I really recommend uh, you check it out. It can just help make your life a lot easier helps make it easier to kind of step away from these things when you need to. Okay, so we do have one last question, which is what scholarly social presence tools are you most likely to use after today's session and check all that apply? While you guys do that one, I'm gonna jump to that slide. Oh, good question about LinkedIn. We'll get to that maybe right at the like five minutes, but yes, great question and something I've been thinking about a lot myself. 
Okay. So it looks like folks are going to be checking out LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Vivo, Orchid, Google Scholar profile, personal website. Someone plans to leave their web presence as is. This is confirmed to them. What they're doing is good. Okay, this is great. I noticed not too many folks are saying Instagram or TikTok. I think this makes sense. Um, you know, there's some scholarly presence on those places. I tend to see it, uh, for instance, with uh, like doctors or health promotion officials making TikTok and other sorts of reels type content. And also in uh, digital archives and collections, we see a lot of engagement with both Instagram and TikTok. Actually, a grant project that I'm working on has created a, a professional TikTok, and it's the first time I've ever had one. It's been a really interesting um, outreach and engagement tool. Okay, so it looks like folks are going to be really concentrated on LinkedIn, Orchid, Google Scholar Profile, and Vivo, and then maybe thinking about how to use some of these social media spaces for the same goal. All right, well, with that, uh, we're almost to the end here. Let me close on out of this part here and hop back over to my slide deck. This Mentimeter did not do what I was expecting there, but it's no problem because we got one tab with all of our stuff saved. So if you like this session, please consider coming back for more Graduate Student Essentials. There's only one left, which is web mapping for every discipline, how to use ArcGIS online. Uh, but you can always check out these previous ones that we've done. We record these and share them on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's also previous years Graduate Student Essentials. Uh, so you can see how I've changed this presentation over the course of three years of doing it. Uh, you can also see some other topics as well, including things like citation managers, scholarly research, um, just a whole bunch of stuff. All right, so with that, I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to go ahead and stop doing screen share so we can do face to face, so to speak. And I will read this question out loud. Yep. All right. So, uh, Pabitri, Pabitra, Josie, sorry for mispronunciation there, Pabitri. I have one general question. What kind of academia related posts in LinkedIn should we consider posting to catch more audience? Like shorter posts are better than a longer one or photos posting or like is photos posting is more effective than writing a lot or some hashtags are effective. What works on LinkedIn? Um, this is a great question. I would say I'm still kind of learning LinkedIn as a more socially connective space myself. I had really thought of LinkedIn as a kind of like, um, oh, I don't know, sort of digital CV or resume but then I've actually started using it to connect with more UIDaho colleagues this year. And it's been really interesting to see that content. So I feel like what I see doing really well is a shorter form thing, maybe two or three sentences, short paragraph, typically paired around um, some kind of event happening, celebrating an accomplishment for someone and using some kind of a graphic to uh, illustrate that as necessary, but not always, right? I think just saying I had a great session today and learned so much in the lab. I see people posting stuff like that and getting positive engagement with it as well. LinkedIn does not seem to be as hashtag driven as the other platforms. So LinkedIn seems to use more the networks of the people that you're connected with to refer you content as opposed to sort of roaming around and trying to find tags to serve you up content with. Uh, so I think LinkedIn, I see uh, sort of maybe Facebook kind of style sharing, shorter length text some kind of a link uh, when relevant or possible, and generally pretty professionally focused. I don't see as many personal updates on there the way I do on like a Twitter professional, personal kind of uh, mix. Great question though, thank you for that. Great question. So uh, a question from a participant. Would I comment about the dur time durability of ORCID and other platforms? It makes little sense to establish a presence on a platform that will fall out of fashion within a year or two. So how can we know where to focus our efforts towards establishing presence? Great question. Um, that's part of what ORCID's supposed to do. So ORCID is supposed to be something that endures for generations. Um, you know, it's one of these long digital preservation efforts. So really the goal is hundreds of years, uh, if not thousands. Realistically, Nonprofits are funded. Uh, if the total, if there's some sea change in how we think about intellectual property, I guess ORCID could stop existing. But in general, most of these platforms that I showed you, I partly picked because they are considered to have a pretty solid durability and uh, prediction of use. So ORCID, I think, is 
here to stay. It's been around, I would say, geez, for at least 10 years, maybe 15 years, which is not a long time in a historical sense, but is pretty long in a digital software way. And it has established itself and is now accepted and embraced by so many publishers and disciplines that it's really hard to picture that ever going away. Something like LinkedIn is sort of like Facebook or Instagram, where you know a lot of us have put in quite a bit of personal content into these different platforms, and there's no real off-ramp, right? Like if Instagram says, we're closing this down tomorrow, uh, what is the solution for all of your content that you have on there? So things like Orchid, I think, are more safe and time durable than something like Facebook or LinkedIn. At the same time, there are so many consumers on Facebook and LinkedIn, it's likely that any closure of those platforms would have a migration plan for something to somewhere else. It's hard to picture that those would sort of just suddenly and abruptly end. But there's also no reason why they couldn't, right? They're a business with a business motive. And so if that worked out for them, they could do that that way. I think Google Scholar is similar to Orchid in that that's a pretty established platform and it's going to be here for quite a while, um, the foreseeable future. But I guess one sort of unknown part of this question is what becomes in vogue in your discipline, right? And so you might spend a long time making an Orchid ID right now, and it's really great for the next 10 years. And then maybe you're a, you know, a geologist and there's now a specific geologist repository that they want people to start steering things towards. It's not impossible, but most of these systems are intended to be compatible with future repository action like that, right? So hopefully your ORCID ID would still play friendly with your geologist specific data. Yeah, thanks for relaying that question, Hanwha. Okay, well, we do have a brief survey, which I believe gets emailed out to folks on Zoom and folks in the classroom, I think have an opportunity to do so. If you could take that, I really appreciate your time. I do take the feedback on there very um, seriously and attempt to revise this to address people's questions and needs. So I really appreciate everyone's time and attention. If there's any other questions or comments, I'm happy to field them. Otherwise, we can wrap up. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for attending. I appreciate all the in-person folks and all the folks with me here on Zoom too. Thanks for coming in. And um, like I said, every remark is very helpful. So feedback is appreciated. Thank you.